All right, why don't we get started? It's um, noon right now. I've just hit record. So, um, well, thank you everybody for joining us. It's a busy week. It's a busy day. We were commenting this group a moment ago that it just seems like we're all, everything just lit up uh, January 1st in terms of workload. So um, thank you for joining us um, for today's conversation. Um, and, and appreciate you spending some time and we're going to try to make this as um, less salesy and, and as practical and, and pragmatic as possible. I know that there's a lot of challenges that we're all facing and uh, we look forward to sharing some of our expertise. Um, so let me just do a couple quick housekeeping thoughts and I'll introduce our panel and we'll get rolling. So um, first, this is being recorded on January 20th of 2021. Look at that, I have a typo already. Um, and part of the reason I wanted to mention that is the um, insights and opinions of our panel will be based on that context. I know many of you are watching this on demand and will be watching this in the future on demand. And so I think it's important to mention that what we're sharing and describing is really based on everything we've seen up to this point. So if you find yourself rewatching this over the summer of 21, wondering why our point of view might seem out of context, I think it was important to, um, to share this. So again, thank you to everybody that is joining us here on Zoom. Uh, my colleague, Katie Source, thank you for all of your help on the uh, tech and, and promotion of all of this. Um, Katie's also set this up to restream. So uh, thank you for everybody that's watching this live on Facebook, um, as well as LinkedIn and YouTube. I think we're streaming on all three platforms right now. So the folks that are here um, live on Zoom, I as moderator will be um, looking for any chat or, or questions that you put in. Um, we'll throw those to the panel as we have time and, and certainly if they're relevant to the broader audience. Um, those of you that are watching this on social media, please put comments in and, and we'll field those offline after the event and share those with our panelists as well. So, so what we'll talk about over the next say 45, 50 minutes or so, um, a fair amount about recruitment and retention. Um, that's really the theme of what we're talking about. And in particular, our panel has some insights they wanted to share on, you know, the role of employees as brand ambassadors and, and how we can harness them um, in particular. What we can do to build a talent pipeline that goes beyond just job advertising and, and postings. Um, and, and some insights throughout that whole thing. Uh, one other uh, topic that I think will be of interest to this audience or our audience is how to nurture and how to engage with employees. Maybe they weren't necessarily the right fit for a particular position, but how do you keep in touch with them and, and should you keep in touch with them to find the right fit ultimately uh, within your organization? Um, so again, this uh, presentation will be made available. Uh, we have links that we can share. And you know, please, if you have questions for those of you that are here with us on Zoom, you know, please put some notes into the chat and we'll try to moderate those as we go through. So. Let me just take a quick moment to jump out of this document um, and introduce our uh, panelists. So seated to my left, <laughs> or however it is on your screen, I wanted to first introduce uh, Miriam Duchesne. Uh, Miriam's the managing partner of Alant Workforce Solutions, um, and that is a professional workforce services firm headquartered in upstate New York. Um, she built the company really from the ground up, launching in 2006 as Linium Recruiting before rebranding a few years ago as Alant. Um, and she and her team have assisted over 400 companies in attracting and hiring more than 4,000 top professionals in, in the decade or more that she's been in business, helping them really gain significant um, national recognition, including selection by Forbes as one of the America's best recruiting firms for the past four consecutive years. Um, in addition to her entrepreneurial perspective and, and work leading recruiting teams, she's also a SHRM uh, certified professional in PHR with more than 20 years of HR experience and really guided by two central tenets that I think she'll share with us today. First, you know, always doing the right thing, overturning a profit, and, and secondly, leading by example. Um, so if you joined us before, um, you had a chance to hear about uh, her work renovating a hundred year old former schoolhouse in the in the Adirondacks and, and her love of painting apparently. <laughs> um, <laughs> but she's also an eternal optimist um, and has to be as a fan of the New York Mets. And, and so um, just wanted to briefly introduce Miriam. Um, seated to her right or wherever we are on your screens, uh, I wanted to introduce Charles Arcola. <laughs> Um, Charles is the Director of Marketing and Sales for Nurse Connection Staffing. Um, Nurse Connection Staffing is a supplemental staffing agency providing um, highly skilled and trained RNs, LPNs, um, and CNAs. And they work with clients to help 
you know, staff um, long term and assisted living facilities, hospitals, medical office, um, school districts, correctional institutions, and, and even government and nonprofit um, organizations and state agencies. Um, Charles really has built his career in workforce development, uh, first working uh, to support the Rensselaer County Chamber of Commerce, but really over the last decade has helped um, Nurse Connection staffing grow and expand their operations. He's helped to um, not only fuel that growth, but also open regional offices throughout upstate New York. Um, and now their firm really services all of uh, upstate New York, a pretty um, wide and diverse region. Um, I'm sure he loves painting as much as Miriam does, but it's not here on his bio, but I know he is excited about volunteering for a lot of community-based organizations, including um, Hospice of Central New York, um, Onondaga Lake Conservation Corps, a number of um, uh, civic organizations like the Ancient Order of Hibernians and Rotary Club, as well as being on the board of directors for a sales and marketing executives um, association. And he was just recently, I'm not sure if this will belie his age or birth date, but recognized as a 40 under 40 um, uh, for those organizations as well. So, and, and he's also a very um, avid outdoorsman, but also snowboard instructor, so. Uh, for those of you taking up the sport, feel free to put those questions in uh, the chat as well as we're kind of going through. So I wanted to welcome too, Miriam. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I wanted to welcome both of them um, to this, and I think many of you already know me. I'm Paul Fahey, um, team leader for Smith and Jones Healthcare Marketing and Communications. Um, I'm excited to join. I'm actually very excited to learn a lot from the panelists and share what I can from our perspective. We've been very often tapped by our clients to help with recruitment and retention campaigns. And in particular, um, you know, recruiting for hard to um, place positions or even you know, hard to attract regions. There are places where um, cost of living may be an issue or um, you know, culture for people who might be younger, um, you know, nightlife and those kind of aspects. So happy to share some of those insights as we're going through. So the chronic issues that I think many of us saw with regard to recruitment and retention, I thought earlier in the pandemic might've been solved by people wanting to pivot out of uh, perhaps travel tourism, restaurant industries into jobs that may be more sustainable, more essential, but that might not necessarily be the case. Miriam, Charles, what are you guys seeing? Are, are we still facing the same challenges that we did before? I mean, for where I'm sitting in terms of um, candidate availability, while there was a lot of people that were affected by the pandemic the, in those industries that you just mentioned, the, um, the, the majority of the roles that I was looking to fill or help my clients fill, um, the skill sets weren't transferable. So most of the skill sets that I was seeking and continue to seek um, are with people that are, for the most part, gainfully employed. And um, what's happening though is people are, you know, if they have something right now, if they're working full time right now, um, they're not as as open to potentially looking at other opportunities because it's even if they're unhappy, they've been waiting it out because, you know, last one in, first one out kind of a thing. So stability, economy, pandemic, um, you know, people who really prefer to you know, stick with the status quo until all of this blows over. There's a, a big portion of them as well. So the, the unemployment numbers are a little deceiving because I've had multiple conversations with organizations that have kind of said the same thing. And I'm like, well, for what you're looking for, in most cases, these people are gainfully employed. So it's, a, it's still a market in which employees have the upper hand. I think you said you mentioned something there too, Miriam, like the skills gap too, right? So, you know, where, where are the skills gaps and what uh, organizations are out there, and especially even in New York State, you know, what role can the Department of Labor's, uh, the Workforce Solutions sites play in that and helping there? And um, another organization I'm part of is American Staffing Association, and they started a, a post the other day about na navigating the talent um, shortage as a result of the stimulus packages, right? So I think a lot of us are seeing that the unemployment benefits are, are hurting us and us, you know, for us specifically, sometimes I get a little narrow minded in healthcare. I just think of us, um, you know, what, what's the incentive uh, of, of going to work? Because many of our staff are, are per diem staff, you know, the, the, the benefit there is they can work as little or as much as they want. Um, so what's the incentive of going to work when, you know, you could get uh, 
still stimulus or unemployment benefits as well. Um, and some of the posts and the response there were interesting. I'm just reading through them now. And it was like one of the posts that said, you got to go old school. You know, you got to get out there. You got to get on the phone, uh, have flyers out there. And, and more importantly, to ask for referrals, you know, and ask for uh, referrals from your current staff and, and your, uh, if you have field staff as well that are out there. So Charles, let me build on that last part, um, asking for referrals from staff. What is the role or what do you see, both of you, the opportunity for employees to be good brand ambassadors? How do you, how do you tap into that? You know, do you just simply send an email and say, hey, we have some job openings, send them to your neighbors, or is it deeper than that? Yeah, certainly, if you don't mind, I'll, I'll start a little bit there. Is a lot deeper, right? So I think it's important, of course, the, the, art, the art of storytelling. Right in general, like um, you know, I know I remember when I first was helping Nurse Connection staffing expand from Albany, the capital district across the state, and it was difficult because we're starting in a new region where we may not have we may have one client or zero clients at that time, but we have to hire staff on first. So, really getting them to buy into your story, you know, and 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 understanding and you know, are, are as a company, are you promoting your your mission vision uh, statements out there? And letting them know, you know, you're getting them a sense of your culture, and then are you living that culture every day? Um, so, you know, once you get them to buy in, then they can be your ambassadors out there. I mean, our best uh, referral comes from our current staff who are out there with our new Nurse Connection name badges. You know, when they're working in the field, um, we do offer uh, referral bonuses for for staff as well. So um, I noticed some other companies out there, some of our competitors, they even offer referral bonuses. You don't even have to be a Part of the organization. I don't know how that's done through payroll, but that's a separate issue. <laughs> but um, yeah, so getting that out there, you know, offering incentives to, to do so, and then, and then, like I said, really telling your story um, and, and, and asking for feedback too from your current staff. You know, why do you choose to work for an agency? One of my favorite responses I got when I asked our staff last year of why they chose to work for an agency such as ours is the one nurse said, I chose to work for an agency because I knew they would place me where I was needed the most. It's like, okay, that's why I do what I do every day. You know, sometimes we need those reminders and affirmations as well. So, I mean, Charles hit it right on the head. I think the first thing an, a company needs to do is don't think that you can go out and have um, your employees be employee ambassadors if your corporate organization, culture, mission, core values, all of those things are not in place and aren't solid. So, um, you know, I, I was talking to somebody several times last year where, you know, people were struggling with the whole remote work aspect and the, the team aspect of that. And I said, honestly, I think companies that had good solid cultures and good solid practices were doing just fine during the pandemic if everyone was working remotely because they were already solid and strong remote work came in and poked the holes or actually exposed the organizations that really weren't doing a good job on that front. So first, make sure that your culture is in check, your mission and values are in line, your employees believe in that, and then start to encourage them to be ambassadors. You can do that a, a variety of different ways. Social media is a, a big area of doing it. Encourage your employees, first of all, if you don't think your employees are on social media and aren't doing, you know, it, work and connecting and networking with people that way, then you're silly, like stop, you know, prohibiting, you know, posts or those types of things. It's better to actually get them on board and help promote your organization. It could be whether it's through a community event that you do, it could be, you know, employee of the month type recognitions that you do, um, employee birthdays, uh, all of those things that kind of show the culture in addition to the jobs that might be available. So I think that's important as well. So utilize the tools that you have available to be a very good experience for your organization. And you know, a lot of people, the counter argument is that, well, what if they're not happy and they're gonna say a bad thing about the organization? Well, honestly, how you'll be judged is how you respond to that and handle that situation. Because guess what? It's not going to stay quiet regardless if the person is posting on social media or not. People tend to share negative experiences about 15 times more likely than they are positive experiences. So it's how you handle a situation. And honestly, maybe you need to know about that negative comment or remark because it needs to be addressed and taken care of. And sometimes maybe that's the only way it's gonna get out there. So I wouldn't be afraid of social media and negative comments from employees, but make sure you have a strategy to address it and put your company in the best light. 
And then from a referral perspective, yep, you can pay for referrals. I, I have a, a different philosophy on referrals, I think, than other organizations might. Mine is, yes, ask for referrals, but ask for, for referrals of your top performers, your people that are happy. You should know who's happy and not happy and engaged and not engaged, but also make sure it's a diverse slice of your work demographic and population. So, you know, be very mindful of that. You know, it's a, a climate of increased exposure to diversity and equality. So make sure your referrals and your techniques for recruiting are attempting to be intentional in terms of finding diverse candidates for those jobs. So I would you know, be very mindful in that and do an active campaign. Don't just say we have employee referrals, go to people, talk to them, ask them and get them involved from that perspective. That's a, that's a good point. Very, sorry, sorry. Let me jump in one, for one quick second, Charles. I'll throw over to you because I want to build on what you and Miriam had just said for a second. Um, I, I love the notion of, you know, A, Charles's comment about storytelling and, and both of your comments about building and, and communicating that you have this culture with a set of values. And I think that's something really important to keep in mind in the coming year. We've all been hit very hard by the pandemic. We had elected procedures that were put on hold and that's really hit our revenues. I think in particular, the opportunity to build the brand and rebuild the brand in the coming year is gonna be important. We're going to be tempted to want to put every dollar into service lines and just kind of keep ringing the register. But if we can push those values out, if we can start to talk about what it is we stand for, what it is we recruit for, you know, and if our headlines are, you know, forgive the basics, but, you know, that we only hire the best, you know, people who care the most. Well, that's going to be a brand building opportunity for us. At the same time, we build an appreciative culture internally. Uh, I've always been a big fan. I think many of you that tune into these hear me say, please don't use stock photos, you know, please highlight your employees, use real people, attribute them. This is Paul from Latham, New York. Um, you know, just, I think that it, it creates a level of authenticity. And I think pe people internally and externally see that very appreciative tone. And, and honestly, this is healthcare's 9-11 moment. This pandemic, you know, is shining a very bright light on the hard work that we do, much the same way we looked at firefighters, you know, after 9-11 they're seeing us doing really amazing work, putting ourselves and our families at risk, you know, we're exhausted at the end of each day. And, and there's a time for your organization's leadership to really celebrate that. And I think that goes to creating some of that cultural tone that, that Charles and Miriam were saying. Uh, Charles, I interrupted you a second ago. What were you going to say? Uh, just a few things that, and going off what Miriam had said. So, because we have recruiters across the state, right? So I always ask them, you know, weekly meetings and such, and I want them to have a, a top five, you know, staff in, in mind all the time that they can go to, uh, that they can rely on for a referral, um, that they can rely on for maybe competition feedback, uh, you know, so who's your, you know, your top five uh, staff that you know you can rely on and go to, because uh, it's, it's important to have, you know, that, that sort of relationship with with those that you hire and, and what are you doing to keep them engaged throughout the process you know it's easy enough to say that yes everybody throughout your organization should have a, a, a job uh, in retention right but what are you doing are you putting an action plan into it so um, recently we did put a 30 60 90 in place so our recruiters are the first ones to follow up so the recruiters get them um, through the application phase being hired and onboarded with our hr and clinical team um, but within those first 30 days, the recruiters are going to follow up and, and see how things are going, you know, and just a simple check in, um, you know, are you being cleared at a facility? I'm sorry, I'm kind of gearing this towards healthcare, but, um, you know, are you cleared at a facility? Have you been working? Do you have any questions on our mobile app? Also gives them an opportunity to, to ask for maybe another referral. 60 days, we then have HR following up a little bit more, digging deeper into, you know, uh, is everything working again, you know, that mobile app, uh, time and attendance other functions of payroll and such may be involved in there, but certain questions. And then important too, we implemented a, 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 an anonymous survey at 90 days, because we don't always get that most candid feedback, right? When they're talking to somebody that they know, um, depending on their comfortability of, of what they're sharing. So, you know, allowing that anonymous type survey is important as well. Um, just as important it is to onboard too, but it's also important to, I think, have exit interviews as well. So if you guys are not, if your companies are not currently doing exit interviews, you should. Um, it's valuable feedback, you know, good, bad, and the ugly. 
Um, and then one more thing off what Miriam said too is recognize your employees. Um, I love you know the the you know employee of the month, quarter, year, uh, but it should also be ongoing, right? And if you do for one, you have to do for all, right? So uh, we also put together a special recognition committee. It's everything from birthdays, work anniversaries. Thank you for your outstanding work. How are you recognizing those? And just again, making sure if you're doing for one, that you do the same for everybody. Yeah, thank you. And I think, um, and, and Miriam, I'll throw to you. Um, so Charles, what you're starting to describe is there's this continuum. It it in you know goes beyond just you know here's your position, there's your location, welcome aboard, go. But I think you know what what you're describing in my mind keeps that retention you know building. So Miriam, um, let me throw to you. Um, thinking about that continuum, thinking about onboarding and retention. You know, what, what did you want to add to that? So. Um everything that Charles just mentioned is absolutely um, important for engagement and retention. Um, when he was talking about the anonymous surveys, uh, it's so funny because, you know, we are in similar industries, but we, we do totally different types of placements. So we really don't compete with one another. But um, everything that he's doing within his organization, it's like from the same playbook for us. It's the same exact stuff. Um, because we have a whole workforce, you know, and for both of us, we have two workforces. We have what we would call our internal team, and then we have everyone that's out in the field, but they're all our employees. And so treating them all the same, giving them the same recognition, creating that um, environment and that culture of, you know, continuous feedback loops, HR check-ins, all of that stuff is really important. Recruiting Recruiting doesn't end when you hire the person. It might take on a little bit different form, but that individual is going to be a representative of your company. And if you treat them well and you do all of the right things and you have all of these safeguards and things in place, they're gonna be more likely to be an even better employee ambassador for you. The other thing is when he was talking about the surveys, you know, if you're getting surveys and getting information, that could be a great marketing tool depending upon you know, the feedback and the information. And um, if you do, I mean, I recommend to my clients when I'm working with them through the onboarding piece of it is you should do um, an onboarding type of, um, you know, entrance interview. And what I mean by that is tell us, you know, it can be a survey form. It could be just, you know, you know, anecdotal, but tell us why you were interested in working here. Tell us what drove you know drove you to actually accept our offer. What could we improve about the candidate experience as you were walking in the door? Like you liked this, but maybe we could have done this better. Get feedback actually at that point instead of waiting until when they're leaving. And I want you to get feedback when they're leaving too. Hopefully they don't leave. But, and if they don't leave, then you may never know that. And you might win them over as they become an employee long-term within your organization, but you would, should really understand kind of what drove them there and what was good and bad about the process, just getting them in the door. And that says a lot about the organization and actually can kind of fix any hesitations that employee might have about joining your organization if the candidate experience didn't go as well as it should have gone. It's a way for you to say, hey, what did we do well? What didn't we do? And we wanna fix it now because we don't want that to happen again. So we value your opinion. And you can use all of that to just then continue to build that employee relationship with that, um, that person and that team. So let's take a step back for a second as we're talking about those moments to onboard, which I think provides good data for how we communicate, what we learn about, why, um, how do we start building that talent pipeline? You know. I think it probably goes a little bit beyond just job postings, but, you know, bring me up to that moment where somebody is given an offer, you know, what advice would you have for our audience on, you know, the, the way to structure a talent pipeline that might be different than you might think. So the talent, so we call them talent communities. It can, can be considered a pipeline. It's different from the, the people that you hire, not that they're not talented and they're not your talent as well. But when I look at it, you're looking at two different types of categories. So your employees are your employees and your talent pipeline are people that maybe not now, but could be in the future. So applicants, people have shown interest in your organization. You know, if you have a, if you do, you know, interview seven, 10 people for a job and then you shortlist them, but the people that you interviewed for the most part, they had a lot of the attributes, attributes that you would have liked for your organization, but maybe they lacked a skill set 
or maybe they locked something that just wasn't going to get them over the finish line at this point. My recommendation, and it's a lot more work and people don't like to do it, and I recognize that, but it makes a difference, is get back to them. Actually tell them why they weren't selected for the job. What could they do to potentially be selected for a future position? Please stay in touch with us. Create a community in which you can engage with them with company information, updates on products and services, maybe some internal stuff. For us, it's easy. We just invite them to follow us on social media and we stay in touch with them. Um, and perhaps you want to encourage old applicants, um, go to your systems and look at your, your tracking database and your applicants and it's been a year, reach out to them and say, it's been a year since we met, would you like to update your application and resume on file? Because you may find that they have skills that you could use now that you, they didn't have a year ago. So it's, it's really taking that candidate experience and then pushing it forward so they can be a, a potential candidate for you in 6, 12 18 months down the road. So it's that entire like basically loop of engaging with them, providing feedback, providing closure, providing updates, information and opportunities to continue to interact with your organization. That's one talent community. Another talent community could be as simple as your customers and people that have worked with your organization that like what they get, like how they're being treated and potentially could be opportunities as well. So, you know, everybody thinks about marketing products and services different than marketing employment opportunities and the employer brand. And a lot of times they go hand in hand because people want to work for companies where they like the product. They, they have a loyalty to the brand. And so you can take people that potentially might be customers of yours, do similar things um, obviously not ask them for an application if they've never applied, but you can do similar types of engagements with them and get them interested in your organization, potentially as an employee themselves, or maybe they have a friend, maybe they have a family member that would meet an opportunity. So those would be a couple of ways where I would nurture talent communities. And then how you structure them is going to be completely up to the company. You can structure it by skill set. You can structure it by department, it could be a, a variety of things. So you'd have to kind of look at what would work best for your organization. The key to the talent community, in my opinion, is you're gonna have two different types of things going on. You're gonna have an applicant tracking database. You have all of your applicants that have ever applied be in your database. You should always go back to that and look for talent, number one. But there's a difference between that talent engagement and those top maybe five people that stood out, didn't get the job for whatever reason, but stood out as potentials for the future. That's a different group, and those are the ones you want to give a little bit of extra attention to, a little bit more special information, make, make them an insider's club. There's all different ways that you can do it to get those people to stay engaged within your organization. And oftentimes, I have candidates that never get placed by our organization but are huge ambassadors for our company because they had such a good experience when they were with us when we were trying to help them find a job and that can just you know obviously pay big dividends charles let me throw to you there's, there's so much there miriam <laughs> that's great <laughs> that's great I, i'm taking notes too so i'm learning a lot as well <laughs> Uh, a couple of things stood out to me that I just wrote down with transparency. You know, I think that that's a, that was a great word there. Uh, you know, being transparent of why they were a good fit or why they may not have been a good fit, right? Um, and, and empathizing too of where they are in, in their careers and where they want to go. So I think, you know, if as leaders and as recruiters, um, if we're seen as a good resource to to them, you know, they'll come back. If we're seen as a connector as well, so. You know, really digging in, you know, during that interview or the first time you connect with somebody, what they really want. Um, and, you know, when I say being a resource, so our times are changing, right? You know, we even just implemented a new ATS system uh, last summer. And we know that, you know, so does does their client's resume, is it is it able to be transferred easily to an ATS system where it auto populates for you? So, you know, Maybe, you know, even just being a resource for helping somebody rewrite their resume um, or start a resume, you know, that's important too, um, being that resource for them. And uh, yeah, I, I love the fact that, you know, you said, whether it's, you're giving feedback throughout the process, right? So there's that transparency. Um, 
and, and asking them, you know, again, what do they need help with? Where do they feel there'd be a best fit? And then, you know, maybe they may come back to you or they know somebody. Not everybody's a healthcare worker, but they probably know a healthcare worker. Um, so that's where we want to be out there and just connecting and and even how we you get that person to find you, right? And your company is, I think one of the best things we've done for our nurses over the course of the past few years is letting them tell their story. Um, so, you know, why they, you know, a couple platforms here. So maybe for nurses, I'll say it would be like, why did you get into healthcare? More often than not, the answer is my mother, a family member, you know, it's in the blood, right? Somebody got them into that industry. Um, or, you know, another platform I've been using is why do you choose to still work on the front lines during a pandemic or in general? <laughs> no, it's a, but, you know, giving them that platform and then that allow, then it also gives me the tools to, to give them the platform on social media. And then this is telling more about our culture. And, and, and then that's being seen by, by others to, uh, to draw them to your companies. It's a roundabout answer. <laughs> Yeah, and I'll mention, um, and again, this kind of goes back to what I was saying before, but I think it's relevant here also. Um, you know, the the going beyond just the job postings and promoting on social media, promoting indirectly about what I love about my job, what keeps me on the front lines, really can reach the person that's not the active job seeker. You know, there may be folks that you know aren't going through the classified sections that don't have an Indeed or or aren't you know registered with your organization already. Um, I remember, you know, 20 plus years ago, um, earlier on in my career, um, one of our strategies for a recruitment and retention campaign were to run display ads in the lifestyle section of the paper of record. And it was really designed mostly for that indirect referral, you know, where a mother might be reading the paper and seeing something and remarking to a family member, her daughter, whoever, you know, son, whoever it is, and saying, hey, I you know, noticed that so-and-so really is hiring, or it seems like they have a really good culture there, and you may not be happy where you're at. Um, now that's obviously evolved into social media, but I think that's one of those really, really interesting places to you know reach somebody that's not just necessarily that direct job seeker. So, and and, so and I guess that's what well, companies need to do right now, Paul. Is um, there's a difference between an active job seeker and a passive job seeker, and active ones are going out and looking who's posting jobs, where can I apply, who can I connect with to try to find a job. Oftentimes the better candidates, and I'm, I'm only saying this as this isn't a blanket statement, um, many times the passive candidates, so people who are gainfully employed, who don't have their resume on Indeed, who aren't like looking at job postings every week, um, typically tend to be the ones that you, you want to get in front of. Because yeah, they might not be looking today or tomorrow, or maybe they are really unhappy in their organization, but they haven't like come to the realization that they want to make a change. But at the same time, they have a family member or a friend, you know, telling about this, that, or the other company, or, or I see, have you ever heard of this organization? They seem to be doing a lot of stuff lately, or whatever it might be. So um, the goal of making an impression with passive job seekers um, should be part of the strategy for any organization and their recruitment plan. Yep. And so in addition to social media, um, I think email kind of comes to mind, you know, how you can just drop in some of those candidates into your email systems. Are there any other tools that people should be thinking about to stay engaged with applicants either before or, or you know, if they weren't selected? You have to be careful with email. I gotta be honest with you. Um, you know, it, um, Charles, I think said it earlier at the old fashioned um, picking up the phone and trying to talk to people what we have found with our methods is I'm a call for, I used to be a call first, email second, and, you know, follow up often until someone got back to me. Anyone you call and they don't know your phone number, you are probably not going to get them to answer the call for the most part. I mean, it depends. What we have found is oftentimes um, texting. So texting people, in making an introduction that way, maybe um, in our text, giving them a link to a job. Um, something to try to start a conversation. And from there, we often will get a response via the phone or text back. Yes, I'd like to talk with you, whatever it might be. Email is a little bit more difficult. I mean, think about it. I don't know about you, but when I, I turn on my personal email, I literally hit the button that selects everything as junk mail. And then I go through really quickly and unselect the ones I actually wanna read. And on any given day, what is that, two emails? 
So email messages can get lost. So I would recommend that maybe use it as part of your strategy, but don't rely just on email. The other thing is LinkedIn is a fabulous tool. It, you know, I consider it social media. Most consider it part of social media. It's the professional social media platform of choice right now. Um, that tool is great. And if you're messaging from LinkedIn, it's even better because then when they get it in their inbox, it's a LinkedIn message rather than just an email. And sometimes that will trigger them to at least click and view the message. So I find LinkedIn is a very helpful tool, but you want to do it from a standpoint of not just targeting people constantly, do networking, um, those types of things, uh, and, and use a combination of intel, so to speak, to you know, try to connect with people that you might want to connect with. So that, that works pretty well for our organization in terms of that. And, um, and yeah, the best way to do it is um, pick up the phone and try to call people. And if they'll, if they'll answer your call, thumbs up. But usually you can get a text and then you know a range of phone call after that. But it's also volume too. You, you're gonna have to uh, reach out to a lot of people and, um, and just be not resigned to the fact, but understand that the statistics of it are you know, if you want to get five potential candidates for a job, you're probably going to have to reach out to 40 if you're doing complete active recruiting and you're not waiting or, or looking at job postings or people who have actually actively applied to you. So, and that's, you know, that's going to change based on the job, but it's a, it is a little bit of a numbers game um, in terms of, and that's not just for, that's not just for our industries from an agency's perspective. That's the same thing on the corporate side. So, um, you know, the post and pray days, just don't work like they used to. And you have to be a little bit more active in your strategy to get people interested in your organization. Miriam, just a question there. Uh, and this may be directed towards your Sherm experience too. So I know on our job postings, we had to include in there, by applying to this job, you're allowing Nurse Connection staffing to call you, email you, and text you. So is there a disclaimer on there? I wasn't sure over the course of the past year or two, I think there was the texting aspect, you know, just because we're all getting Protocol. Um, you know, I don't have that disclaimer. I've not been told by any legal counsel that that's something I need to add to my job postings. Oftentimes, um, I think I think texting has changed from what it used to be. So texting used to be, you know, you paid per text, and there was all of that data issues that people had years ago. That really seem to be the case anymore because people just have unlimited plans for calls and texts and whatever. So. Um, but what we have been told is if we do some type of, if someone you know responds, take me off your list or don't text me again, we have to make sure we identify that and do the proper protocols in our system so that we're not reaching out to them again. But I don't actually have that on my job postings. No, I think it's assumed and commonplace for people to understand that they are going to be contacted in some way, shape or form if they apply. Yeah. Yeah. To save our recruiters some time, we, we've done that too, because we know, you know, probably 60 to 70% of the time, we're not going to get them on the first call. Um, so we kind of have an email template, you know, let them know, and then a follow-up text as well. It's like, hey, this is Charles. I'm not a spammer. You know, I'm <laughs> just following exactly. up. Doing That's regards. what my texts usually are, is I'm not, a, I'm, I'm not a spammer. <laughs> yeah. It, yeah. One thing I would say about templates is, is obviously templates and those types of things can save you tons of time. But be careful in complete re, completely relying on a template all the time because after a while, it can. If you can be personal in your messages and and draw something out, whether it be there's something on their resume or LinkedIn profile or somebody they follow, or I've seen your your name come up a couple of times with some of my connections, um, you know, it, it again, it's more work. But um, if you can try to take that template and then like personalize it as best that you can, um, I, I find that works a little bit better in terms of um, at least piquing someone's interest. Yeah, I've even seen people um, take some of those templates and do a very good job trying to customize it. Dear Paul, you know, here's the position title that you know, name of the position that you were applying to, et cetera. But then the font is changed. So you have this one, you know, you name and you know, title and stuff. So I think, you know, even as you go to customize it, just check it, maybe test it, make sure that it, you know, technically looks as good as and, and custom and personal as you, uh, as you can make it. Um, so we were chatting a minute ago about, um, 
you know, nurturing those candidates that maybe not weren't necessarily the right fit for a particular position, but maybe down the road could be somebody you would consider elsewhere in the organization. How do you reach out to that? I mean, this is not my area of expertise, but I would think if I applied for a job, you know, in a particular, say I wanted to be a, a you know, nurse or I am a nurse in an OR surgical suite on a surgical team. And that's what I identify with. That's what I'm currently doing. That's what I applied for within your organization, but you didn't hire me for it. But maybe you have a similar, you know, position, but in a different department, you know, in, um, you know, some other, you know, department within the hospital or wherever. How do you, convince that person to consider it, you know, um, you know, what, what are some of those strategies, I guess, to, to get them to think about other opportunities that, you know, beyond what they had initially applied for? Yeah, yeah sure. <laughs> sure. Uh, <laughs> so a number of things are going through my head right now. So because our company as an agency, we are, the staff who come to this, they have to have at least a year experience, right? Not everybody has that year experience or uh, even the other way too, maybe an LPN has, you know, 14 years of experience as an LPN, but they just became an RN. And we still need that full year as an RN experience. So I think it goes, it's having good relationships with our client facilities. And again, going back to being a connector, empathizing with them and letting them know you care. Like, please, you know, we can't, you know, unfortunately work you right now, but I'd love to, you know, here's a list of our clients that I'd be happy to connect you with and, and making that connection. Number one, you're going to make your clients really happy too, you know, the facility clients and then those, those employees as well. Um, and even it, it, like I said, getting, let's get, let's have deeper conversations with people too. Like, you know, in healthcare, there's so much burnout, you know, it seems like even in, even from the, the, the C level, the administration, the administrators, uh, directors of nursing, every two years, they're getting burned out. They're, you know, they need a break. So, you know, it's knowing, I think in the banking world, it's know your customer, KYC, you know, know your client, know your, um, you know, know your staff and, and, and what are they going through every day and, and how do they feel? Maybe they need to change, you know, and I think mean, came with this pandemic, we have a lot more opportunities to do, you know, different screenings. So maybe taking them out of that long-term care hospital setting for a few months, giving them a little bit of a break and getting them into a different setting, maybe that'll just help them. Um, or even saying, hey, you know what, you know, you're per diem staff or you can work as little or as much as you want with us. Let me have you take a little break for a little bit too from us, you know, and, and just to, to give yourself some time. Um, but yeah, I think the more you could be seen as a connector, um, the better off you will be long term and you'll get more referrals from that. I mean, it circles back to what we were talking about before. If you if you treat them like a number and they get a, a template email that says thanks, but no thanks with no follow up information or anything you're gonna have a harder time convincing them down the road to reapply for a job. But if they're a candidate that you like what you see, but there's a reason, a legitimate reason, which there should always be a legitimate reason why they weren't selected, um, try to have a personal conversation with them or send a personal follow-up email, you know, thanking them for their time, thanking them for their interest, encouraging them to stay in touch with your organization letting them know that you were a great candidate, but we just couldn't hire you for this role because of this reason. And if you if you establish that rapport and that relationship with the person, they're gonna be more likely to potentially keep the lines of communication open or look for other opportunities within your company. But if you treat them as just a number and another piece of, another piece of paper or a resume, it's gonna be really hard to um, then get them to be more excited about applying to your roles in the future. And I, as I also said, you know, for those great candidates that have potential, invite them to update their resume every six months, invite them to, you know, give you a status on what they're currently doing and up to. I mean, that's common practice for our office is, you know, people that we've worked with and we haven't necessarily placed right away, um, you know, following up with them frequently and saying, how are you doing in your job search? What is, what's changed since the last time we talked? Are you still interested in hearing about opportunities? Like all of those things um that uh, will keep the person engaged so it's about being engagement and and how you treat the person through the candidate process that will help you in the future yeah so it's a all coming up on about 10 of uh, the hour and i would love to wrap up a few minutes beforehand i think for me this is the new gift if somebody wants to schedule a meeting with me and they started at five after or they ended about five of I love, I'll, I'll vote yes on whatever else you have and thank you for that break in between. So as we kind of come to the end of the conversation today, um, 
uh, Charles and Miriam, I'm going to throw you guys, you're not really ready for this, but, um, you know, it's that kind of one piece of advice question, and I'll ask it in a second. Um, because our audience is diverse, we have people that are that are tuning in now and watching on demand that represent urban, suburban, rural healthcare organizations, larger health systems, really robust teams, smaller teams, um, you know, and, and so you know, give us that, that sort of parting thought. If our organization should only do one thing, either validate what I'm already doing or tell me the one thing that I, I could or should be putting into place right now to really help um, build a stronger talent pipeline, what would that one piece of advice be for somebody? Whoever wants to go first. Or I'll keep riffing while you guys think of your answer. <laughs> I know, I'm, I'm thinking of what my answer should be because there's so many answers. I mean, I think for for if I were to walk away uh, and I'm, I'm talking to an organization that needs help with recruiting and regardless if they hire us or not, they need to know if their efforts are actually working. So if you do not have metrics and measurables in place to really know where your best candidates are coming from and who your top talent is and where they came from, you need to figure that out because you could be wasting time, money and energy on actions and activities that really aren't making, they're not moving the needle. So I would make sure that the organization knows what works for them, gets rid of what doesn't work for them, and then um, continues to focus correctly. I mean, there's so many things, but if I were to just pick one, I think it's, you know, know your market, know your metrics, know what's worked, and um, you know, invest in that so that it can continue to be successful moving forward. But also be open to evolve and change because nothing ever lasts forever. And some new trend, new trick, new thing's gonna happen. And um, you have to also be open to change um, to just keep being relevant. So give me a quick um, follow up on that. What's a good metric? I mean, should I be in interviewing, you know, somebody to say, how did you hear about this position? Or, or you know, what are a couple metrics that you would recommend somebody pay attention to? You should look at your applicant flow on where the where the people are coming from. So, um, you know, you should be able to see, are they applying all from Indeed? Are they going to, you know, is Facebook driving them to my website? Is LinkedIn driving them to my website? Those are all capturable data. So I would say first, you know, where, where are you getting visibility? Um, and yeah, making sure you know where the candidate has come from, where they've seen your information, whatever it might be. It could be employee referrals. Most of your candidates are employee referrals. You should know that. You should know what your numbers are. So um, that would be a, an excellent um, a data point. And then you also want to look at other things, but you know, from, from just knowing where your people are coming from, that's an excellent data point and, and something that you should be easily able to access. Okay. And Charles, well, what... Uh, yeah. What's your one thank, piece of advice? Thank you for starting that, Miriam. <laughs> yeah, I took one for the team, buddy. Because <laughs> <laughs> if we were together, you'd kick me under the table. Like, we didn't rehearse this. Why are you throwing me this curveball? Okay. <laughs> I, I think just to uh, double off what Miriam said as well is, yeah, important to know the numbers. It is, it is a numbers game out there. So, yeah, knowing where, um, you know, knowing retention numbers, your turnover uh, numbers, is, turnover rates as well is important. Um, and where those candidates are coming from. So I like, think like in last year, we had, we said 40% of our referrals were coming directly from our staff. Uh, another 40% indeed is that I still consider them the elephant in the room. Um, they are the number one resource online. Um, so, but that's good. So it's good to know where you're hiring from and maybe you're putting more money into that as well. Um, and also then the other side is know who you're recruiting for. You know, uh, you know, as Gen Zers are in, in the workforce now, um, do you need to be a little bit more creative? Should you be on Instagram versus Facebook? I mean, Facebook does give some great analytics. If you're um, part of an administrator there, you can know when your customers or when your uh, followers are online during what hours of the day. So maybe you're doing posts catered around that time. Um, or, you know, do we need to get a little bit more creative and, and start, you know, TikTok, whether you like it or not, it's out there, people are using it. Um, you know, so maybe you just create a video and that shows some of your culture. Um, one of the things I try to instill in everybody here at the at the office uh, is learning, right? And and understanding that I think if we all and, and with everything going on in the world today, I'm not going to get political. <laughs> um, but uh, you know, if if everybody took the approach again that you know we have more in common than we do different, and if everybody took the idea that anybody you meet throughout the day, whether it's a cashier at the gas station, 
um, or anybody, again, that you encounter, you have an opportunity to learn from that person. So whether it's the candidate that didn't fit your company or if the candidate was the, you know, a great candidate and you're ready to hire them, you have an opportunity to learn from them. So, you know, if I were to ask you, would you learn from uh, Paul today or from Miriam today? You know, of course we could say, because you gave us a great platform to do so here, Paul, but you know, what did you learn from, from anybody you interacted with today? And if you can kind of, you know, either uh, recap that with yourself at night, uh, you know, think about what you learned today, you know, it might be a great tool just to, to carry on with you. No, that's great, thanks for sharing that. And I think as both of you were agreeing about the concept of metrics, I see that's something that's gonna be increasingly important in the coming year, you know, as we're gonna be challenged with either doing more with less, you know, potentially having our budgets cut. The more that we can prove, you know, please don't cut this aspect of it because I can prove to you that 28% of our candidates last year came through this door or whatever it is. I think that's gonna be important, you know, even for our own self-preservation, the ability to retain our teams and our budgets to be able to do what we need to do um, is gonna be, you know, in, in more, uh, under more of a microscope with our leadership and our trustees um, as they ask, you know, prove it. You know, um, it's the old saying in, in advertising, I know half my advertising is working, I just don't know which half. And, and so the more that you can justify it and defend it, the more you're gonna be able to preserve and, and keep it, so. Absolutely. Um, well, this has been great. Thank you both for sharing your time with us. Um, we'll send a follow-up note out to folks that registered. Um, thank you for all of you that are joining us live here, not only on Zoom, but also watching this live stream on uh, Facebook, LinkedIn, uh, and YouTube. Um, we'll start to look at some of the comments that are there on social media, share those with the panel. Um, and I'll put their contact information, not only on this webpage, if you're watching this on demand, but also as we email to thank everybody for registering. And if you couldn't join us live to be able to, to you know, not only watch it on demand, but also um, questions that you might have for our panel. So Miriam, Charles, thank you so much um, for, for sharing your time, your experience. I think this has been really helpful. I learned a ton. I'm scribbling notes throughout the whole thing, so. Well, can I, can I just leave you two with a couple, maybe scary Please. statistics here. All right, so I just pulled a okay. couple things recently. Yeah, and end us on a high note, Charles. Yeah, right. Yeah, right. <laughs> right? So this, this is a scary one. So 65% of people see online search as the most trusted source of information about people and companies. Scary, right? But it's true. <laughs> Last year, 29% um, of current workforce was made up of internal referrals. So again, going back to that, engaging your employees, keeping them engaged. Um, and then the other piece too, of course, mobile friendly, we have to be, right? So 78% of candidates um, who own a smartphone will apply through a job through their mobile phone. Uh, so keeping that mobile friendly device there as well. And then uh, the last one, 53% of candidates uh, trust a company when it reaches out quickly. So I know right in our job yep. postings, yeah, we put on there, thank you for applying, a recruiter will be in touch with you within 24 hours. So get back to those candidates as soon as possible. Those are great, perfect, thank you. Those are good little nuggets to have anyway, I guess. Um, not terribly scary, those are good. No. Yeah. Facts, <laughs> data, it's you important. You had to be worried there for a second. I know, right? <laughs> I was like, oh, what's he gonna do? Get ready with the, the seven seconds. You, hit, you hit us with one, so no. <laughs> <laughs> right, 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 right back at you, Paul. <laughs> Um, well, thank you both very much. Uh, I appreciate you sharing your time and experience. Um, enjoy the rest of the day, and we'll see you again here soon, I hope. You too. Thanks so Thanks much. Guys. Take Thanks care, everybody. guys. Bye-bye.